love to praise him. Do you love to praise him? If you love to praise him, give him a hand clap of praise.
welcome you to this beautiful day to be in the house of God, praising his holy name together. We welcome you to this first Sunday. We celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a community in communion. We welcome you to this first week of Black History Month, which I hope for us is just the official recognition and not the only month when we study what great things God has done to, with, and for our people. I want to ask us now to turn our hearts toward what will be our all, all of our eventual home, to direct our minds to heaven as we go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for blessing us to be here in this moment. We thank you, Father, for blessing us to be. We ask you, Lord, to look upon us and see us as only you can. To see the often conflicting picture of our talents and our issues, of our potential and our problems, of the great blessings you have given us and the great sins we have committed. And we ask you, Lord, to do a mighty work in us all and in us each. Forgive us, Lord, for every sin. Forgive us for the great wrongs we have done. Forgive us for the small wrongs we perpetuate without thought. Forgive us for the good we could have and should have done but failed to. Cleanse us, Lord, of every thought, every habit, every mentality that keeps us from walking right with you. Deliver us out of the darkness into your marvelous light. See, Lord, somebody who is lost and confused. And give them purpose and clarity. See, Lord, somebody who is anxious and worried and, and provide them with comfort, with peace. Provide them with provision. Those who are poor and in need, provide, Lord. Mind, body, and soul as only you can. See, Lord, these your people gathered together in your name and grant us clarity of vision, grant us unity of purpose, grant us diligence and discipline to do what you've called us and what you have made possible for us to do and become. See, Lord, your people, known as colored once, as Negro once, as black sometimes, and African American the other. See what we need from you. Awaken in us, restore to us the promises prayed out and given to our ancestors who cried out to you in bonds and chains. See, Lord, the needs in our community and raise up servants and raise up leaders and raise up workers to meet those needs, to overcome the difficulties. Bless us, Lord, in all the ways we need you. Restore the broken relationships in our homes and in our communities. Restore, Lord, the broken relationships we have with our past and with ourselves. Help us, Father. Despite all that is arrayed against us, help us to grow. Help us to increase. Help us to prosper and help us to walk in joy, beauty, and holiness, and grace. Father, we ask you to see us each in all the ways that we can contribute to the work that you are doing in this church and in this community and in this world and to point us in the right direction so that as we move and breathe and have our being, others will look at us and say, and say, I know, I know that one serves a living God. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Good morning, Bailey. Good morning. Praise God for today. Amen. Our scripture comes from Second Chronicle. 12, 1 through 12. And it came to pass when, Re when Reban had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsake the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Reban, uh, Shewick, king of Israel, 
came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. And with 1,200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Labians and the Salivians and the Ethiopians. And he took the fence cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then Shemai, the prophet of Rabban, and to the, the princes of Ju, uh, Judah, that was gathered together to Jerusalem because of Sherah, and said unto them, Thus said the Lord, You have forsaken me. Therefore I also left you in the hand of Sh uh, uh, Shinwit. Whereupon the prince of Israel and king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemai, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shemai. Nevertheless, they should be servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdom of the countries. So Shemit, king of Israel, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king, the king's house. He took all. He, carried, he also carried the, the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Roban made shields of brass and committed them to hands of the chief of the guards that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king enter, entered into the house of the Lord, the guard, the guard came and fetched them and brought them into the guard's chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judas, Things went well. God add a blessing to the reading of his word and humble your heart to receive it. Amen. Amen. Morning, Bailey. Morning. Let us stand, please, by our Apostles' Creed. And what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father of all men. From thence shall come the judge, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You'll be seated. This is our Holy Communion Sunday, and I wish that you would join in with me, if you will, and pray in the prayer of general confession found on your programs. You may remain seated as we confess the general confession. Let us all together, congregation, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Make of all things, judge of all people. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorrow for these our misdoings. 
The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may hereafter serve and please thee in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all of them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn to thee, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Everybody, almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all time and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God. Everybody. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord, most high. Amen. <coughs> Once again, I want to welcome all of you who've been able to join us, whether you join us directly or remotely. Um, we ask you to be mindful of a few announcements. Next Sunday is second Sunday, and we will have our church conference. Um, I will send out an email. We may do next Sunday strictly by Zoom. As of now, it will be an in-person and hybrid church conference. But please check your emails in case there are changes to that. But we will have church conference next Sunday after worship. Remember that coming up in a couple of weeks is a men and boys um, weekend. We have men's day, February 19th. And on Saturday, February 18th, will be our men and boys college recruitment breakfast. Our young adults continue to read books by black authors to our children during children's church. And we will resume in-person children's church next Sunday. So please bring your kids and know that we have activities planned for them in the Ola May Center. Sunday school continues by Zoom at nine on Sunday morning and Bible study continues on Wednesdays by Zoom at noon and at 6 p.m. Bible study is open to everybody, whether you are a member of the church or a visitor. And if you have someone that you would like to invite, feel free to share the Zoom link with them. If you're missing that link, text me or text Regina. I don't have any other announcements. Are there any others I may have forgotten? Do we have any visitors with us? See some home folks we ain't seen in a minute. You ain't got to say nothing. You can. <laughs> um, any visitors or home folks who do want to say something? It is the joy to see you all, to have you with us. I just thank God so much that you were able to be here and for those who are able to connect with us remotely. May God bless you. At this time, we have our Black History Moment. There you are. I was looking out there for you. Good morning. Good morning. Today's Black History Moment will be about the history of Black history, which is traced back to Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a Black writer and historian known as the father of Black history. Dr. Woodson was born on December 19, 1895, in New Canton, Virginia, to former slaves Anna and James Woodson. He did not begin his formal education until he was almost 20 years old. In just a few years, he earned a high school diploma in West Virginia, his first undergraduate degree from Berea College in Kentucky, and a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Chicago. In 1912, Dr. Woodson became the second black person to earn a PhD at Harvard University. In September of 1915, Dr. Woodson, along with Minister Jesse E. Moreland, 
founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which is now called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. With the establishment of the Journal of Negro History in 1916 and the Negro History Bulletin in 1937, the Associated, Association created research and publication outlets for black scholars. In 1926, the Association sponsored Negro History Week in the second week of February. That week was chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. The event inspired schools and communities nationwide to organize local celebrations, establish history clubs, and host performances and lectures to honor the contributions and legacy of African Americans across US history and society. In the decades to follow, mayors of cities across the country issued early proclamations recognizing Negro History Week. By the late 1960s, Negro History Week had evolved to Black History Month across college campuses. In 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month. He called upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Every U.S. president since then has designated February as Black History Month and endorsed a specific theme. The Black History Month theme for 2023 is Black Resistance. Its purpose, according to the association, is to explore how African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression in all forms, especially the racial terrorism of lynching, racial massacres, and police killings since the nation's earliest days. Some people don't see the importance of Black History Month today. However, on June 23rd, 2020, the Alabama Department of Archives and History acknowledged that for much of the 20th century, it promoted a view of history that favored the Confederacy and failed to document the lives and contributions of Black Alabamians. And that was just in Alabama, so imagine across the US. So we can see why Black History Month is still needed and should be celebrated not just in February, but 365 days a year. More information of the history of Black history can be found at the Association for the Study of African American Life and History at asalh.org, as well as the History Channel at history.com under Black History. You can learn more about Dr. Woodson's early years, publications, and legacy at biography.com. And you can read the Alabama Archives Department's acknowledgement of its role in distorting Alabama's racial history at al.com. Thank you. Have a great rest of your week and a knowledgeable Black History Month. <laughs> Good morning, Bailey, good morning. and all our visitors. So good to see so many faces here this morning as we engage in our first Sunday of February and the first Sunday of Black History Month. It's an honor to have this opportunity to come before you at this time where we lift our offering. Just briefly, just wanna to touch on a couple of things. Uh, if, if you're not actively engaged in our Sunday school, which is still in Zoom right now, I urge you to get up with one of our superintendents. Brother Steele, will you raise your hand? Ms. Belcher, will you raise your hand? Just get up with one of them and get your information to them so that you can become a part of an extremely informative learning opportunity. There's never a Sunday that I'm able to join that I don't leave and take something away. And I know some of the people who are there, they say, you don't ever participate. Well, sometimes the best way to absorb is to just shut up and listen. And so usually I just shut up and I listen and I absorb so much information. One thing that stood out this morning for me, though, was this term that I've heard before. Uh, but 
it just had, I don't know, because, because I was in that hush and listen moment, I was able to absorb it in a different way, I think. But I know we probably all heard of this notion of conventional wisdom. Uh, if you watch TV and you listen to the news, sometimes they'll say things that have happened like uh, conventional wisdom would say whatever. Well, I want you to take that thought and recognize, like we discussed in Sunday school, that doesn't always mean that the conventional wisdom is the correct wisdom. Conventional wisdom tells us that when we get paid, we take some money and we set aside our sum for us first, make sure we have a savings. Then we take care of all our bills and we pay, you know, for living and utilities and such. And in conventional wisdom, you know, God is often not even included in how we distribute our income. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to think about it and go against conventional wisdom and recognize how we should first address the source of all we have. Everything that we have, not just financial, not just in property, but in family and health, in knowledge and wisdom. Everything we have comes from God. And so against conventional wisdom, I offer you that when you get what you have and you examine it, first thing you do is you give thanks to the God above. And then you wait to hear what he asked that you should do with what you, he's given you. He's already given us instructions of a tenth should, should come back to him. One tenth, a dime out of every dollar. $10 out of every 100. But that's not where we stop at being obedient. We need to be listeners and continue to hear what God has for us and what he's telling us day by day, what he shows us day by day. Sometimes you may have, you may encounter people who are in need God may be telling you it's time for you to step in and, and take and take charge. Sometimes it may be just someone who's suffering a loss, who just needs to know that you care. So right now I ask that you consider these things as you prepare for our offering. Finally, we know that in the month of February, we also celebrate Men's Day here at Bailey Tabernacle. And this year, we're asking for every member to be generous and give $125 in a special offering above and beyond your regular giving. And we ask that you, you do that. You can start today if you haven't already, or you can wait until third Sunday when we actually we'll have our program, but in any case, you can do it by visiting the baskets at the entrances. There are envelopes there and should be pins available for you to designate how you would like your gifts distributed. We're also set up now where we can receive your donations electronically. If you have the give, if you have a smart device, you can use the Givelify app or go on to the Givelify website. Or you can go to PayPal and search Bailey Tabernacle CME and make your donations there. Both those locations will also allow you to designate how you want your gifts distributed. And finally, we still use the U.S. Postal Service. You can mail your donations to Bailey Tabernacle CME, P.O. Box 3145, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 35403. And again, I urge you, 
if you haven't, if you're not participating in Sunday school, please see, get it with the pastor, send him your information or Miss Regina Steele and be a part of a Sunday morning blessing. If you will now, just join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful, Lord. Thankful that you are God and that you're merciful and you share your grace with us and have allowed us to see this day. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us, especially, Lord, all the people that you have given us through time. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and his blood. But we especially thank you, Lord, for the, the example that he walked here on this earth. We thank you for all the people in our heritage that allowed us to be able to experience the things that we do in this day. Thank you for them. God, I thank you this morning also for those who will give and those who are, have a desire to give but don't have. I ask a special blessing on them, Lord. Open up your windows of heaven. Lord, bless us to receive these gifts and to use them according to your will to uplift and build your kingdom. Bless the sick, I pray. Bless the bereaved. Comfort them, strengthen them, I pray. In your son Jesus' name, amen. As Reverend Page comes to lead us in altar call, I want to submit to you a few prayer requests. Let me ask you to remember our most recently bereaved families. I remember Brother Joe Patrick's family. I remember also Sister Mary Lucius's family, who was um, just funeralized with us on yesterday. And let me ask you also to remember Sister Bridget Eatman, the, um, the Fowler's niece, and keep her lifted up. She had surgery and is recovering well, but because of the nature of the surgery, she is actually recovering in ICU. So remember Bridget Eatman as you pray along with our bereaved families. And we turn to Reverend Page and lead us in altar call. I would like to, uh, at this time, welcome back Brother Howard McCain from his surgery. Amen. It is now time for our altar call. The altar is open if you care to come down and, and bow down to the Lord or if you care to just pray in your seat. Remember these, this scripture here. Second Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, turn from the wicked ways, seek my face and pray, then I will heal the land. So this morning, God hears you. So that's why it's, it's called prayer. You're praying to the Lord God above and not your next old neighbor. So you don't have to even worry about nobody listening because it's the old saying that people in Bailiff might know this. This deacon came down, Stuart rather, came down and prayed and he didn't he didn't say a word. Got him back to his seat and the Reverend asked him, he said, we didn't hear you. What you? He said, I, I wasn't talking to you. So you don't need no one to hear what you're saying. You are praying to Lord God above. This is our altar call. Yes, ma'am. Come on in my room. Come on. 
Come on in my room. Jesus is my doctor, and he fills out all of my scriptures. Uh -huh. He gives me all of my medicine in my room. Come on in my room. Come on in my room. Jesus is my doctor and he breaks out all my scriptures. Uh -huh. He gives me all of my medicine in my room. Henry tell the preacher to come on in my room. Yes. Tell the preacher to come on in my room. Jesus is my doctor and he writes out all of my scriptures. Uh -huh. He gives me all of my medicines in my room. There is love in the room. Yes. Love in my room. Jesus is my doctor, and he writes out all of my scriptures. He gives me all of my medicine in my room. There is joy in the room. Yes. Joy in my room. Jesus is my doctor and he writes out all of my scriptures. Uh -huh. He gives me all of my There is peace, peace in my room. Oh, peace in my room. Jesus is my doctor, and he writes out all my scriptures. Uh -huh. He gives me all of my medicine. In my room, come on in my room, come on in my room, Jesus is my doctor and he writes all of my scriptures. Uh -huh. Amen. Let's try to say amen. 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 Yeah. I hadn't heard that one live in a minute. That's all right. Give the Lord some praise. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right to ask for the Lord to be in the church, to be in the nation, but sometimes you need him to just come right there where you are. Right on up in the room. Amen. There is a word from the Lord. And it falls to me to do my best to speak it. So may I ask y'all to pray for me. 
and pray with me. Father, come on in this room. Move among us all and among us each. Speak now a word for your people in this moment. A word that we need and only you can deliver. Use me according to your will. Make every word of my mouth, cause every meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. But let me get out of your way while you are moving in the room. Let me hide in the shadow of the cross. Let me rest in the cleft of the rock. And use me, Lord, that in all the next moments to come, all of our attention would be on Jesus. In whose name and for his sake we pray. Amen. I'm not exactly sure how it happened. But somehow over the last 2,000 years, things got confused. Somebody somewhere got confused and began to think the world was firmly divided between black and white. And white folks have power and black folks have problems. And that's the way God wants it to be. Somebody somewhere got off track and started telling folks that Jesus was white and black folks were evil. Somebody started saying that Africans didn't know God until Europeans showed up to trade Christianity for their freedom. They said that there are no black people in the Bible, and if there are, they were all slaves and servants. Well, I happen to have read the Bible, the whole thing. And the Lord told me to tell you that somebody done told you wrong. And there's a word from the Lord, church, and the title of the message is simply, we in there. We in there. Some folks say that, that that doesn't matter. The Bible is about Jesus, not about race, they say. It doesn't matter what color Jesus was or what ethnicity were those folks in the Bible. Okay. But why y'all get so mad when somebody does a movie about Jesus and he got dark skin? The black presence in the Bible was so important to slaveholders that they made it illegal for slaves to learn to read or even possess a book, especially if that book was the Bible. And as Sister Josephine Dantzler informed us the other week during our Black History Moment, the very act of slaves gathering together for worship was considered dangerous. The reality of the African presence in scripture mattered to slaveholders because they knew that if our ancestors were aware that we are and have always been present and powerful and important to God's plans, then their empire of lies in Jesus' name would not stay. In fact, Africans have played a determinant role in several critical points of Bible history beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and continuing for the next five chapters, scripture records how God called and used and moved African empires to correct and restore Old Testament Israel. I told you, we in there. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Let me show you some biblical black power. Second Chronicles 12 takes place in the southern Jewish kingdom of Judah under the rule of King Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son and successor. But verse 1 says that when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel went along with him. And so God punished Judah. Verse 2. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shashak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because Judah had transgressed against the Lord. And they came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, people that they couldn't even count, came with them out of Egypt and also brought with them the Lubim and the Sukkim and the Ethiopians. Now, to be clear, Egypt was the lead country in a coalition of multiple African nations. The Lubim are modern day Libya in North Africa. The Sukum were a group of desert tribes also in North Africa. 
Ethiopia was an empire of Central and Southern Africa, there is still a nation of Ethiopia, the surviving parts of that empire today. Note that this Pan-African force came, the Bible says, because Judah had sinned against God. The Africans were God's instrument of punishment against the Jews. In 2 Chronicles 12, 5, the Judean prophet Shemaiah came to King Rehoboam and gathered the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of this invasion of Pan-African tribes. And the prophet told them, thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me and therefore I have left you in the hands of Shasha. The Jewish prophet told the Jewish leaders that the African folk have been sent by God. This Pan-African coalition was militarily victorious and they were spiritually obedient. When God sent them to conquer, they conquered. Second Chronicles 12, 4, they took the fortified cities of Judah and came to Jerusalem. When God told them to show mercy, they were merciful. Second Chronicles 12, 6, the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to the African general, Shemaiah, and told him, Judah humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I'll grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out in Jerusalem by the hand of Shashak. Nevertheless, they will be his servants that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms and the nation. The Bible says in verse 9 of 2 Chronicles 12, the African armies were victorious and merciful. And in verse 9, those armies carried away the treasures of Jerusalem, stripped Rehoboam of his father's riches, but they left God's temple and the city and their lives intact. We in there. And we are not in there begging for Massa to let us be free. In scripture, our ancestors were warriors and empire builders, international coalition makers, cross-continentally connected to the direct revealed will of God. The Bible says that God gave and directed black power. Black power is a great thing when black power is obedient to God's will. But even black power outside of God's will leads to trouble. Jump over to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 14 says that Judah got a new king named Asa. And in 2 Chronicles 14 too, it says, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nevertheless, in verse 9, an African general named Zira, who was from Ethiopia, came out against him with an army of a million men and 300 chariots and came against him. So Asa went out against him and set his troops in battle. The Bible says, 3,000 years ago, a sub-Saharan African nation was so vast and mighty that they could field and march a million soldiers and 300 chariots, which were the ancient equivalent of tanks, and arrive battle ready at the gates of Jerusalem, 1,500 miles away. But they told y'all there weren't no great civilizations in Africa. They told y'all that Caesar and Alexander the Great had the greatest army that there ever were. The Bible says they lied. When this million man march showed up outside the Jerusalem, Second Chronicles says, verse chapter 14, verse 11, Asa cried out to the Lord his God. I bet he did. And he said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. And in 2 Chronicles 14, verses 12 and 13, it says that God struck the Ethiopians, and Asa pursued them, and the Ethiopians were overthrown so that they did not recover. Hold on. The Africans lost? But in chapter 12, the Africans were God's power behind the judgment. How could they lose? Preacher, I thought you were talking about biblical black power. In chapter 12, 
the people of Judah had turned away from God. And the African army was obeying God. In chapter 14, it's exactly the opposite. Judah was doing right in God's sight and Ethiopia invaded anyway. Jews can be wrong. White folk can be wrong. And black folk can be wrong too. Our place in God's favor is not determined by our skin or our culture or our ancestry. Our place in God's favor is determined by our obedience to God. When our culture lines up with God's will, we can change the course of a nation. That's what happened in the civil rights movement. It isn't a coincidence that the leaders of the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement, the one that ended legal segregation, had titles like reverend and minister and bishop. Without Christ, we can do nothing, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, black power empowered by God's command changed the course of the nation of Judah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 13, in between them, Abijah, the, the king in between, trusted God, and God gave him victory over his enemies. Ironically, in those days, the greatest threat against the southern Jewish kingdom of Judah was the northern Jewish kingdom of Israel. Let me, let me rephrase that. The greatest threat of violence against the Jewish people was Jew-on-Jew Jew violence. Sometimes, it's people who look just like you who are your greatest enemy. Yeah. Yeah. White folk kill white folk at much higher rates than black folk kill white folk. Asian Americans are more likely to be killed by another Asian American than by a member of any other ethnic group. Most of the time, any given culture is its own worst enemy. The problem of black people killing and sabotaging one another is not, as we've been programmed to think, something unique to people whose ancestors came out of Africa. Our problem is an age old human problem. The leaders of the nations kept the Jewish people divided so they could hold on to their power. And that's why Judah in the South and Israel in the North were going at it. And those national leaders promoted internal division and self-hatred so successfully. But that by the time we move from the Chronicles to the Gospels, the Jews in Judea couldn't stand the Jews in Galilee, and the Jews in Galilee and Judea wouldn't even talk with Samaritans who were descended from the Jews, but the other Jews don't think they're real Jews, and the upper-class Pharisees called the lower-class multitudes ignorant and accursed, and traditional Jewish men didn't respect Jewish women enough to even speak to them in public, and the upper-class Jews were kissing up to the Romans while telling the lower-class Jews that they hated the Romans, which was fine with the Romans, because they ran the whole country and killed a bunch of Jews any time they felt like it. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Scripture is a mirror that shows us ourselves. And when we look into that mirror, it shows there's more to us than black and white. In Acts 17, Paul speaking to a bunch of European philosophers says, we are made from one blood. And every nation, every culture experiences the same cycles of problems and prosperity as they seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though we keep forgetting that he is not far from each one of us. In 2 Chronicles, the intervention of black power set God's people, Israel, back on the right course with God, but they still ended up fighting each other. And that infighting weakened them and set them up for trouble when the Romans came in from Europe. In 2 Chronicles 14, Asa, the great grandson of Solomon, became king. And for years, he was a godly man and a good spiritual leader. He was a good military and economic leader. But Asa didn't prosper just because he was from a certain place or because he had a certain family. God made a point of warning him that his prosperity was tied to his obedience. In 2 Chronicles 15, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. The spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Odin, and he went out to meet King Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found. 
But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. In conservative Christian media, a lot of people talk about how God's going to judge America for its sins. When New Orleans flooded by Katrina, they said it was God's judgment on all those sinful Negroes. But I didn't hear the explanation when the when the hurricane flooded Texas or South Carolina, New Jersey. The South, as we've heard, particularly Alabama, has the highest and fastest growing rates of AIDS, drug addiction, poverty, unemployment, unwed pregnancies, violence, incarceration, infant mortality, and death from preventable diseases. You know, in scripture, you got a name for that. They call them plagues. If you look into the stats, and then you look into the Bible, you realize God has already begun judging the people of this nation who have most terribly departed from his will. And apparently, that's not the liberals up there in the north. We, the people of the Bible, Bill, the people with the most churches and the most self-identified Christians in the country, are living in complete contradiction to the word of God. Our leaders talk about Jesus. No, actually they don't. They talk about God. Mm. And they talk about value. Mm -hmm. But they don't talk about Jesus for real. Because if you talk about Jesus for real, then you got to talk about what Jesus actually said. And then you listen to them carefully, they don't want to get into what Jesus actually said. Our leaders talk about Christianity, but their actions, their policies, and even their personal lives are exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. The political and cultural leaders in the South, black and white, are like King Asa. They start off good, but then they start cutting deals and forgetting about God. Because in 2 Chronicles 15, 12, it says, Then Asa entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God that with all their hearts and with all their souls. In other words, they signed a pledge to honor God. But in the next chapter, 2 Chronicles 16, 2, Asa brought silver and gold from the treasure of the house of the Lord and sent them to the king of Syria, saying, let there be a treaty between us as there was between your father and mine. I sent you gold. I sent you silver. Break your treaty with that other dude and be with me. And then the king sent his armies against Israel. See what happened? The good king. The believing king, the one who had all godly and biblical values, that leader cut a deal with the heathens so the heathens would help him against his own folk. He cut a deal with unbelievers against people who were his political opponents, but his religious brothers. Does any of that sound familiar? Black power had put his nation back on track with God. And then the leaders adopted convenient politics of division and backroom deals in exact violation of God's will. And maybe Asa thought that because his skin was maybe a little lighter than the Ethiopians, that God would let him get away with it. Maybe he thought that all he had to do was stand in front of the flag and talk about making Judah great again. God would notice. But 2 Chronicles 16, 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7. Haniah, the Jewish seer, the Jewish prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the arm of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Asa wasn't supposed to cut a deal. He was supposed to stand up for God. We don't have to accept every sorry candidate they send us. We don't have to enable the oppression of our brothers over there so we can cut a deal with their oppressors over here. That's the game that the enemy runs because they think that they are the only ones who are in there. They don't realize, and sometimes we forget that we are in there too, that we have the same access to God that they have. We don't have to depend on them because we can go straight to God. Second Chronicles 16, the Jewish prophet reminded the Jewish king, said, you forget what God has done. Were the Ethiopians and Lubim not a huge army with very many chairs and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them. When we're right with God, we win. When we line up outside God's will, we lose. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro across the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf, not of black, not of white, 
but on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. The leader had not given justice. So God refused to give him peace. Because that's God's slogan too. In James 4, a question is posed. Where do your wars and fights come from? And the answer is given rhetorically. Don't they come from your desire for pleasure that war in yourselves? You lust and you don't have. You murder and covet and can't obtain. You fight and war, yet you don't have because you don't ask. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask wrong so you can just spend it on your pleasures. Race doesn't determine our favor with God. Obedience determines your favor with God. Some folks find it hard to accept. But now now the prophet told Asa that God was going to treat him just like he had treated the other kings of the world. Asa went off got angry and he built up his arrogance and he kept on doing what God had told him not to do. And he tried to silence the voice of protest and he went and put the, the prophet in prison because he was mad at him. And he attacked anybody who said anything wrong. And Second Chronicles 2, 16, it says he oppressed some of the people at the same time. Let me put that in contemporary language. When the nation sinned and God sent word that the nation would have to deal with terrorism just like other nations, and the nation would have to deal with attacks in their streets and marketplaces just like other nations. And when they thought they were done fighting one enemy, another enemy would come out of nowhere for them to fight just like in them other countries. Then the king got mad and turned against the prophetic voice of the condemnation and declared, I don't care what God says, we're going to make America great again. When Asa the king died, he was buried in extravagant honor, even though he died in excruciating pain without ever repenting of his sin. The leader suffered and died and most likely went to hell, but it was a real nice funeral <laughs> because he would not accept that God would judge his nation just like God would judge any nation. He couldn't see beyond black and white. Our community, our state, our region, eventually our nation, point blank on the way to hell in the golden casket. Because we think that black power and white power, whatever cultural power determines God's faith. We can save our community, our state, our region, and our nation. We realize that the only thing that truly matters is that our power is lined up with God's will. And when I say that, don't misunderstand me. The Bible is clear. God is not colorblind. He sees our racial differences. He sees our cultural differences. He didn't make us the same. He made us to be different, but he loves us the same and he will judge us the same. If we confess our sins and turn back to him, he will forgive us the same and restore to us the black power that it redeemed this nation before. He is not far from us, from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also, as also some of your own poets have said, we are all his offspring. No matter our race, our nationality, our geographies, we are all children of the same God and descendants of the same bloodline through Adam and Eve. And yes, the Bible is for everyone. Red and yellow, black and white, we are all precious in God's sight. But don't let anyone convince you that the black children were an afterthought. Because from the beginning of God's word to the end, you find our answers recognized and named and loved and used by God. What I'm saying is we in there. From the very beginning of God's word and through his work, even the work of establishing Israel as the guardians of his word, God's black children are recorded, hearing God's voice, building and running our own nations, walking in God's will. We in there. Before there was even a mention of Rome or Greece, or any predominantly Caucasian culture, our ancestors are called out in scripture. The Bible says that African empires mobilized in Jehovah's name while the ancient Britons were still sacrificing folks to trees. Not that it matters, because you know the Bible ain't about race. It's about Jesus. I'm just pointing out that we are actually in there. Our people are in the Bible. But, but your people in the Bible don't guarantee that you are in the kingdom. I mean, heaven is real, but the question is, will you be in there? Right. Just as our ancestors collectively and individually had to seek the Lord, so you 
and I each must seek God for ourselves. What I'm saying is we in the Bible, let that be established. But the question now is, are you in the kingdom? The question now is, what is your relationship with God? We've established what the collective relationship of our people, of our history is with God. But what is your personal relationship with Jesus? Because just as Ethiopian generals in ancient time had to listen for the voice of God, so now you each must listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Is he saying to you, baby, come to me? Is he saying, my son, my daughter, Come to me. If you came in this place and you are not in a personal relationship of salvation with Jesus, don't wait. Get in there. Come to Jesus now. If you came in this place and, and you didn't been saved, but you ain't been walking right with God and you know that relationship is broken, come back and let him heal you. If you're in this place or you're hearing this message, you know that there's something God is calling you and moving on your heart to do, but you've been afraid or you've been reluctant, that's okay. Come to him. He'll put you in there. If you're in this place, you need somebody to walk with you, to pray with you. Come. God will put you in there and he'll give you victory as long as you give him you. The doors of his kingdom are open. If there's anyone in this moment who desires to come to the Lord, let me ask you to stand. Just real, very briefly. Stand for me. And in that way, if anybody wants to move, they you already up and you can let them by. If anyone desires or is willing to come just a little closer to God right now, whatever it is you need from him, whatever it is you need to give him of you, understand that he's been accepting our people since he's been accepting and making people. But you. You need to come to him for yourself. You can't come on the backs of your ancestors. You can't come on the prayers of a mama, a mud deer, a big mama. You got to come for yourself. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one? God bless you.
now toward our service of Holy Communion. If you are present and you did not receive element when you came in, would you please raise your hand? Understand that God is present even when we are not all physically present in the same room. God can come on in the room even when a bunch of rooms come on in. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, yes. So God is present with us. We also remember that when Jesus and the disciples gathered for that last supper, that Passover Seder meal, what became our community, they didn't have any special bread or wine, they just had whatever was commonly available. Then the Jewish house of market during the Passover. So what you got is colonial or dollar general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you got is saltines or whatever. That's fine. Because it wasn't special because of what it was made of. It became special for Jesus' blessing. Yes. Amen. 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 <laughs> So at this time, I'll bless the elements and we can gather together. Come on, man. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who will by tender mercy give thy only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross by our redemption, who made thereby his oblation of himself once offered for the full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and then instituted in his holy gospel, commanded to continue perpetual memory of that is precious death until it's coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we must humbly beseech thee. Grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, holy institution, and remembrance of his death and passion, we may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. He who in the same night he was betrayed to the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shared for you and for many for remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it 
in remembrance of me. Amen. 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 Before we share the elements, let us, by this is and together, pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and forgive us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Take the elements. We're going to turn the bread side up first. Move the elements and take the bread. Let's take the bread and eat together. Those joining us at home, eat with us. The bread reminds us that Jesus gave his body and broken for us. We take now the cup. Let us drink together. And remember that Jesus shed his blood and gave his life for us. Keeping with story and account of scripture. It says that at the end of sharing the bread and wine, they sang a hymn and went out together to the God of God So let us stand together and sing. Praise God for whom all blessings. all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of god and of his son jesus christ our lord I may the blessings of god almighty the father the son and the holy ghost be among you and remain with you always and let all god's people say together amen Thank you.